because you're jumping back into the gap. I went to coach, it's either sideline, two on the side, three on the side. That's off the second cut. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. Excited today to have Josh Schertz with us from Lincoln Memorial University. Coach, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Appreciate it. Coach, unfortunately, probably not enough people know about the success that you've had at Lincoln Memorial. I know there's a memorial. I know there's a lot of people that do, but it's been incredible, your success there. You're in your 11th season. You've won 83% of your games. You've been to eight straight NCAA tournaments. You've lost in a national final. You've been in two Final Fours. You've developed players, you know, some that have gone overseas, one player that's in the G League currently, and just incredible success. And I just wanted to highlight that so that people understand a little bit. Personally, I've had a chance to watch you both coach and run practice, and I know what a tremendous coach you are and what an incredible experience this is going to be for so many coaches to be able to learn from you. So, once again, excited to have you on. And can you speak a little bit about Lincoln Memorial and the culture that you've built there? Well, I think LMU is a, a really unique place at, at the small college level in terms of when I got here, it was, they had been down for a while and it had not had a lot of success at the NCAA level. They were really good at in periods of time, the, the NAI level, but in the transition had kind of lost the commitment and their way a little bit. And, and I got in and it's really been a, as you know, a lot of us, all of us are in coaching victim of circumstance, whether it's good circumstance or bad. And I just really fortunately got in here at a time where the school was was growing. And our chair of the board, Dr. DeBusk, happens to be a huge basketball guy. He had just built a medical school. We've expanded with veterinary medicine school and a law school, and it just continues to grow and grow. And so went from a job that I don't think when I got it, obviously I was hired as a 32-year-old first-time head coach. There was absolutely no competition for this job to uh, one of the best jobs in the country in terms of the commitment level, the resources, the infrastructure, what they give us to succeed. And so it's right there as a, as a top tier job. And we've gone in and really from day one, we've prioritized trying to, and I think where we've been aligned with this terrific academic school, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the largest nursing schools in, in the country. And like I said, you get a lot of pre-med, pre-law, it's terrific academics, but they're also very committed to athletics. They don't look at that as being binary and they want to uh, give the student athletes the very best possible experience. And so there's really terrific alignment from the top on down. And that's kind of permeated into our program. That's our priority is, is the growth and development of our young men and want them to go on and, and basically be more successful in life for having been a part of our program. And the school does a lot in terms of the academic piece. And I think we try to do what we can in terms of their growth and development, not only as a player, but as a student, as a person. And then once they're gone in terms of graduation, are we helping them with that next step in life? For some guys, that's pro basketball, as you mentioned. For other guys, that's corporate America. Some are in coaching. There, there's guys in all over fields all over the country doing different things and all over the world doing different things. But we want to stay true to that. And there's a stay true to that. And there's, again, alignment from the top on down. Well, it's tremendous support. And coaches, I encourage you to reach out to coach about program building and some of those things. And we're not going to go that direction with this podcast because I'm not going to waste your basketball mind, so to speak. And I want to get into some of the tactical because I think you're just a great basketball mind that we can all learn from. And and I should have mentioned that you're an NCAA Division II team because I didn't mention that up front just for coaches who are looking up Lincoln Memorial right now if they don't know. But, uh, Coach, one of the unique things that I got exposed to when I spent some time with you was your play calling system. And I get asked this question all the time. So this is really important for so many coaches I know. And that your family of plays and your play naming and, and just your black book, which you call it, which is your play booklet. Can you discuss that a little bit with us and let us know? Because I think you have a great system. And, you know, obviously, if you watch some of your games, you guys run some great stuff. But it's even more the organization that I think is brilliant of all this. Well, no, I appreciate that, Dan. We run a lot of stuff. And so what we want to do in our play calling is make it to where hopefully as much of it is in the play call in terms of we always say that the play name should give you alignment, right? And so series for us that are, you know, I would, we run a lot of what we call cut series. Well, cut, everybody's in the same alignment every single time. You know, the, the five is opposite the point guard and what we call the read spot, the low short corner. Four is in the opposite slot of the point guard. Twos and threes are in the corner. And then 
So cut every time we yell cut and we call cut as an early offense, guys understand where to be. Then from there, it really gets into trying to, and we have different families. So cut is a family, what we would call a family of plays. And we have cut, if it's cut step slash, if it's cut point. I mean, we have all kinds of different things out of cut and maybe six or seven things we do. And then similar in other families, you know, we have, if we call double, that's a family of plays and we'll, but what we try to get to is to give people the action inside of what we're doing. So for example, if we call zoom and zoom is a part of a number of family of plays, it's an action. And for us, zoom is a down screen dribble handoff. That's what we call a zoom action for a guy usually sprinting out of the corner. And we can run the zoom out of our double action, run out of a bull action, run out of, out of a lot of different alignments. But so zoom, though, when players hear double zoom, they know double alignment and then zoom is the action. We're running a cut series. You know, we have for us point action is always a pin down. So there's cut point, which is, you know, out of an alignment. There's bull point. There's a variety really in every series we have of point action, which always indicates that we're playing off pin downs and which the family always should give. And so I'll give you an example. You know, if we run cuts. We have a play out of our cut series called cut step slash. So what we're trying to get to there is to get our five man, either a pick and pop shot, depending on who that is. With Emmanuel Terry last year, he wasn't a shooter, but he was a terrific driver to his right hand. So if we run cut, step, slash, we're running a dribble handoff with the four, and he'll go and throw it to the opposite of the corner that he's going to, same side. He'll throw it to that guy lifting out of the corner at the 45. He cuts through. Point being is when the ball gets back to the point guard, step, slash indicates that the five sets a step up. The nearest perimeter player, which was the guy that reversed the ball, the point guard, he is slashing back door on the pop, trying to clear out space for that drive or that shot, depending on the player. And so that would be an example. And cut step is the same exact play out of that cut alignment. There's no slash when the five sprints to set that step up for the point guard. He rolls every time. And that, that other player would fill the window behind. So what we try to do is get to consistency of play call in terms of if we run dribble, that's a dribble handoff. That's particular to every single family. And so for us, our largest family of plays is bull, which is, you know, obviously what most people will call horns, we call bull. And then we indicate inside of there what the action is. If it's bull small, that means we have a guard on one of the elbows and we're running something there. If it's regular bull, that means it's the four or five in there and we have some things in there. But all the actions, whether it's zoom, or point or all that stuff, that's kind of consistent across whatever play family we're using. And so coaches know, like first you start with the alignment, then you go into the action, and then there could be multiple actions within an alignment. And it's consistent language throughout. So a player really essentially, if they know you're in cut series, it's consistent language throughout. So a player really essentially, if they know you're in cut series, then you don't have to call cut. You just need to call, you know, step slash once they know you're in cut. Right. I think it also creates a little bit of confusion for a defense that's trying to steal plays because it seems like there's so many words and in a way it seems complicated, but it's really simple for your players because they know which words mean the most at that time. They already know they're in cut series. So right. no, that's true. And so if we go in like, uh, you know, so, so anytime we, if we were to run cut dribble, they know that's a dribble handoff, you know, cut step is to a step up screen. Step slash means that guy goes back door. And so you can get into, you know, all that. And again, it's, it does sound probably more complicated than it actually is. But, our, you know, when guys know that those things also translate to if we're running bull, they know in bull, you know, we're in a certain alignment or bull small is a certain alignment. And so if we go, hey, you know, we're all kinds of different actions outside of that. But they, they usually are similar like I said, zoom point, you can get into to a bunch of different actions that are, that are pretty similar ghost in all of our series, and they do permeate the family. So once they know the alignment, I think it sounds complicated, but we have five or six families, and then we probably have six or seven things inside of those families, or some are a little bit more. Bull is probably closer to 13 or 14. But at the end of the day, once they know the play call, which gives them the alignment, then you get to the name of the play, 
and you try to be as descriptive as possible to help them. So like in cut, step, slash, that's a lot of words, but they know what we're doing as opposed to cut, step. Right. And as opposed to calling it, you know, down, like, right. like, like instead of having to learn, you know, 60 words, they really just have to know the family and then the actions and the actions are consistent throughout. So it actually makes right. it easier for you to run a lot of stuff. It does. I think it does. It makes, you know, we have a new assistant and and then the actions and the actions are consistent throughout. So it actually makes it easier for you to run a lot of stuff. It does. I think it does. It makes, you know, we have a new assistant and he came from a school in our league. And that's one thing he mentioned to me was, you know, we didn't know how we we thought you must have spent just hours and hours on dry offense because all the stuff you guys run and the guys knew it. And he was amazed that we didn't spend that much time on it. And, And even this year, we have a team that has, you know, we have five freshmen in our rotation and so it's a really young team as young as there is probably at our level but they've picked it up pretty well and and they understand it's not what it was for the seniors and those guys but at the end of the day they're able to do it i do think it simplifies it down because if you just call a play down or you know michigan or mississippi you know i think when you can get to be as you know again give people the alignment and then be as descriptive as possible with what you want to have and if we're in cut point everybody knows the alignment everybody knows we're playing to a pin down so you know if uh, it's cut dribble we're playing a dribble handle they be as you know again give people the alignment and then be as descriptive as possible with what you want to have and if we're in cut point everybody knows the alignment everybody knows we're playing to a pin down so you know if it's uh, cut dribble we're playing a dribble handle they, they know what we're doing and that makes it simplifies it i think I believe in it. I think it's great. And I think it helps answer a question for a lot of coaches that ask it. And I think even more so going a little bit deeper with it. So if you're in bowl, do you generally stay within that alignment for multiple possessions? Or are you often switching from, say, bowl to cut the next possession? Or is there some consistency usually within your play call that we're going to stay in bowl and then we're going to run bowl, then we're going to run counter to bowl, and then we're going to run another counter to counter to bowl? Is that how it works for you or how does it generally go? It's different. So the way I look at offense is, you know, there's different facets of it and you got to kind of be able to transition between them. So the way we view it is on a miss, on a miss, we're not running anything. We're running what we call scene. We can, you know, first big trails, runs rim and runs opposite. If it's the four who's running rim, he'll run opposite corner. If it's the five, he'll run rim and opposite read. And we're trying to pitch ahead. We want to throw ahead, throw across, throw high. We want to get it out and go. And we're trying to play up the floor. And we track, you know, EPAs, early pitch aheads, and try to really attack off that. I think you and I have discussed, you know, throwing it and attacking through the 45 before the defense can get set. So that would be the first thing is, is we never really, unless time and score dictate it, I don't call anything when we're in a miss and we would go, if we didn't have anything in seams, then we would go into what we would call our flow. If it's a made basket, we have five or six families or things that we would call like early offense that are really quick hitters that don't require a whole lot. Cuts an example of that. We have, we call 99. 99 is, you know, our double drag with the four and the five. We have a drag with the four and the five. We have some things we can do out of that, two or three things we can do out of that. Double is a series out of that, which is really a stagger away, double up, double down. We have a couple things we can do out of that. So we have what we would call our early offense. And I would, you know, normally in a game, if there's a made basket, we want to run with pace. We want to run into one of those things and and we're getting into our actions. We're getting into what we do. And then if we don't have anything in those quick hitters, we transition to flow. Bull is more of what we would call, uh, and we have a couple different families of, of half court sets. And Bull would be in that half court family as the largest one. So to answer your question, it would really be now if we see a mismatch or something we want to exploit or a guy's going, then we'll look to run stuff specific to that. And so we may come down if a guy's going and we're trying to run, a, you know, let's say a guy's hit a couple threes in a row, we got a pretty good shooter, get Alex Dalling. If he's made a couple, we may go to some things specific, have an advantage on the perimeter in some capacity. We'll try to go to that. But, you know, we don't stay inside of, you know, one thing, but we will. If something works, I'll usually come back to it pretty quick or at least until they stop it. But we try to run our early offensive stuff. The way I view it is you have, you know, on a miss, you have whatever you do, and then you transition into a flow for us on a make early offense. If we don't have the early offense, we transition to flow half court sets try to run those. Those are a little bit more intricate. You got to set up and again, time, score, momentum. 
who's playing well kind of dictates how often we get to that. And then we go deeper, you know, you would have what you would call your critical offense to me, which is your late clock stuff, you know, shot clocks winding down. What do you do in the final five, six seconds of a shot clock? We've gotten away from ball screen stuff there late in the clock, just because people are switching everything makes it actually usually with with a worse shot. So let's talk about that a little bit because critical stuff thing is, I'm 100% on board to not ball screen because you're bringing an extra defender there and generally you create bad spacing. So what are you doing? Are you ghosting a lot more or what are you doing there? Yeah, so we'll ghost a lot more in those scenarios, bring somebody up and slip them out of it. Or we may say, you know, we'll try to flatten out and sprint and maybe get, try to identify what we would say is the worst defender and sprint him up and make him screen and create the switch we want and then play to space. And really try to give, try to put our best ball handler up there, sprint somebody from the baseline, set that screen, get the switch, and make sure once we get the switch, then we play the space and give that guy room to operate. We've got a couple of quick things out of a flat series. We don't do a whole lot. I mean, there's the ghost stuff, there's the switching stuff, and and we do two things out of flat that we try to run that that are quick hitters that can get us a shot within a couple seconds. But I think you have to break off things down that way. When you're saying flat, you're talking about four across the baseline. And even a lot of times when we get into, you know, when you get into the late clock scenario, and even if it's as simple as trying just to get that switch, we may start in that one four flat and then I'll call who we want to come up. And again, you're trying to engender that switch because most every team switching inside of that final five, six, seven seconds of the clock. But again, you can ghost it as well and you get some great stuff where you bring guy up. They think you're going to screen and try to switch and you slip it and then you get to a a shot or a quick rip drive there. No, it's great stuff and it makes sense. And again, when I've seen it, you know, the two times that I've interacted with you in that way that, you know, it presents an easy template for you to call plays and it creates great challenge for the defense because you can specifically get your players to try and attack the specific matchups you want or the specific situations you want. So it's really good stuff. I appreciate that. We've tried to be execute well there at the end. And, and, you know, at times you do, at times you don't. But for sure, you're trying to put the end of the clock. When you get to that critical part, and, and I know it's not particular to high school coaches, but certainly all of us in college and at the pro level, you know, you're going to be in some of those situations. And, and what are you going to do there inside of the final, you know, six, seven seconds of the clock? Or in a game situation where, you know, maybe you're up two with a, a minute to go and, and you're running a, you know, you got a situation there where at the end of the end of the game, you're trying to convert something there at the end of the shot clock to kind of, you know, create time and score. Coach, you mentioned EPAs, you mentioned seams, you mentioned playing fast. And the first time I learned about you guys when you put up a pile of points last year, I think it was last year's team, right? You put up the the big number. Was it 170 or something you put up? 140? 156, I think. 56, 156. But on tremendous, like a tremendous shooting percentage as well. And it's the first time kind of I, I kind of clued in to who you guys were and what you're doing and stuff. So... Can you talk a little bit about pace and how important it's been to you guys in terms of your offense and I guess generally your recruitment and your your program building as well? Uh, have a style. Obviously, I think you're always fitting. You know, if you have great players, you fit your style to your players. You know, if, you know we've been fortunate. We've averaged, I think, 90 plus a game the last three years or four years. And we're right about there. I think 88, 89 this year with a younger team, not quite as efficient. But I do think pace is, is vital. I do think when you can the name of the game to me is to try to offensively engender as many what we would call quality open looks as possible. And if that happens in the first two seconds or it takes the entire 30 seconds, that's the goal. We always talk offensively, you know, hunt great. You know, our offensive philosophy simplified down or distilled down is take care of the ball and hunt great. And then defensively, obviously you want to make the opponent take a contested shot every time down. Can you explain hunt great coach? Yeah, I think hunt great to me means exhaust all options in search of, you know, if you don't have anything quick, you're not going to usually get easy baskets. That's why they're great defensively. They get back in trans, they guard, they load the ball, they make things difficult. You're not going to get a first drive layup. You're going to have to break them down. And so the ability to get out and try to push and play with thrust and get the ball down the floor and attack. Always, if you can steal easy baskets, fantastic. Against good teams, it could be the difference in winning and losing. It's bad teams that may allow you to get a lot of separation inside the game. But when we talk about hunting great, it's, it's trying to look at and get an open shot 
every single time what we would consider a great look. And so now if your center who's, you know, not a good shooter's out there bombing threes, he's wide open, that would not constitute a hunting great in our eyes. But getting uh, quality shots for our guys and guys understanding, hey, you know, if we didn't have it early, break the defense down and hunt great, exhaust all options before you cast up a, you know, a contested jump, exhaust all options before you cast up a, you know, a contested jumper with 13 seconds on the shot clock because we, we didn't get anything in transition. We moved it, we reversed it twice, and now we're just going to get a, a hang dribble three over the top of defense. Are you willing to kind of continue to move it and continue to break the defense down in the search of great? And then you can always, if you don't get great, you can wind up with that contested, you know, shot with one or two seconds on the shot clock. And then that does become probably the best you could do. Yeah, no, it's a great term. And I think coaches who are listening are starting to figure out that you have great vocabulary, great phrasing of things. And I think that's also important because that helps so much with your players' understanding and their development of really an understanding of your culture and your philosophy comes through your words. And you just have tremendous language to what you speak about. So that's great. We Coach. do as well. I, I, st- I steal a lot of that stuff from other people and, and you as well. There's nobody who's better with that than you and maybe uh, Doug Novak. So you guys are, are uh, trendsetters in that. But than you and maybe uh, Doug Novak. So you guys are, are uh, trendsetters in that. But no. And then on pace, I do think that's key. I mean, when on misses, you have to go. You have to put pressure and stress on the defense and try to see. I think the best time to attack it, the hardest thing to do to me in, on the defensive end is play transition, right? I mean, that's the hardest thing to do no is question. to get back and set your defense. So if that's the hardest thing to do, then wouldn't it make sense to be uber aggressive and really stress that on a team and see if they can do it every single time. The really good teams do it every time or most every time. But you know, like you said, maybe you steal four points or six points, you get a wide open three and a breakdown in transition. And in a game where it's, you know, great on great, those four, six, seven points are sometimes the difference between winning and losing. So we're always going to try to, you know, if that's the most difficult thing, then we're going to try to attack that everything that you want to do offensively, you want to avoid defensively and to attack that everything that you want to do offensively, you want to avoid defensively. And it's obviously the inverse is true. So that's the key for us is to really try to play with thrust, play with attack, but do it in a way that, you know, we're moving the basketball guys are playing. And, and I think, you know, with this team, it's been interesting because you're having to go back and really from a coaching standpoint, because we have so many freshmen, so many new guys, it's almost a little bit of like a restart and a reset. And you're almost going back to teaching at a granular level, you know, in terms of like, this is our system, this is how we do it. It makes you really think as to why you're doing this and is this the appropriate thing and what you're doing. And when you go back and you have to be that in depth, it's, you know, it really, I think it's helped me to evaluate everything that we're doing, but playing with pace, getting up tempo. We've had a couple games this year, you know, 31 assists, 27, 28 assists. And we've been a team that if you look at it historically, I think the last seven or eight years, we've been one of the top assist teams in the country. And we're up there again, and that starts back in eight years. We've been one of the top assist teams in the country, and we're up there again. And that starts back with, you know, guys understanding playing with pace and sharing the basketball. And, you know, it's always, I think, the best basketball, and people think that these things are, you know, are binary. Like if you're playing with pace offensively, then you, you can't be a good defensive team, which is not true. I think, you know, you can certainly do both. That's without question. And I think the sweet spot for everybody, and I don't know everybody, but at least for us, is finding equilibrium in paradox. So we always talk about offensively, we want to play fast and loose and disciplined. Now, how do you find that balance? But that's when we're at our best. I don't think anybody's good when they're playing with the weight of the world on their shoulders and you're micromanaging every dribble and every shot, you know, is just everything rides on that shot, you know. And I don't think anybody's good when they're, you know, playing fast and you're turning the ball over 30 times a game. Sounds for any coach is to find that balance and that comfort with the pace and then with the risk reward part of it, which, you know, is part of it. But as you've shown and as you guys have demonstrated that if you're doing it right and you're deciding, hey, what are some of the things that challenge you as a coach to defend? Those are probably some of the things you should be doing on offense in your league right. or, you know, at your level. And it's different at different levels, but certainly I think pace is, is so important. Coach, going to practice and watching you guys practice, and I mentioned this to you, the first thing was 
your behavior at practice was outstanding. Your demeanor was outstanding. There was no point where your players didn't know that you were coaching and you had their interest in heart and you were able to correct things. But at the same time, you never needed to raise your voice. You never needed to demonstrate behavior that wasn't becoming of a coach. And your players still knew that you were the one there that was leading them and helping them improve. Can you speak a little bit how that's evolved in your time? You were the one there that was leading them and helping them improve. Can you speak a little bit how that's evolved in your time? Well, normally I'm, I'm a raving lunatic, but you were there, so I was on my best <laughs> behavior. I knew you were in town. I normally don't buy I'm, that. I don't buy I'm it. kicking balls in the stands, and I'm, yeah, I'm doing all kinds of crazy stuff, yeah. but you were there, so I was absolutely on my best behavior. No, I think it probably goes back to you got to be who you are, and I think – you know, for me, my natural personality is one that when I'm out there, I'm not a guy who's going to scream and yell and berate. I don't think, and there's times when I get mad and I'll, I'll, I'll get upset and no one's perfect. And I'm not above that. I'm not at all I'm trying to say, you know, holier than thou in, in those regards. But, you know, I think when you're out in a situation and guys are, you know, making mistakes, but they're trying, I think, you know, your, your job is to correct them. I think you can create an environment, or at least I'm most comfortable in an environment where there's some positivity. And, and I don't think people sometimes mistake that. Like if you're not out there and you're not ranting and raving and you're not, you know, just yelling at the players and running them and, and doing all the stuff that you're not being demanding. And that's nothing to be further from the truth. I think you can be supportive and demanding. I think you can push guys without really disparaging them or demeaning them or, or, you know, or making them feel badly. It would be weird. I mean, I know coaches think differently, not all coaches, some coaches, but like if you walked into a math class and I know because I was always this kid, you know, and they call you up the board and you get it wrong. And the teacher is just, you know, cussing you out and shaming you in front of your classmates. Like it would be a huge deal. Yes. But that supposedly is, is acceptable because it's sport. And I don't agree with that. And so to me, again, it doesn't mean that I don't get mad. It doesn't mean that we don't have conflict, lack of effort, guys not focusing those, you know, who I am as a person. It goes back to, I think when you go into any good program, regardless of sport, it doesn't really matter. You could just walk in and, and you can feel usually a good program just by the environment. You don't have to know anything or atmosphere around the program. You don't have to know anything about the sport to walk in and see a really good program and just you can kind of just feel it in the atmosphere and environment that surrounds it. For me, I'm most comfortable. One of our core values in our program is joy. And we want guys to enjoy the experience. It goes back to what we talked about at the beginning and, and the culture building here. That is, I do think we're among the luckiest people on earth to get to coach and play this game. And we should never lose sight of that, that it is, you know, I always tell my wife, it's amazing to me that I get paid to teach people to put a ball through a ring. You know, that's what I do for a living. And so, you know, you can't, again, doesn't mean you're not demanding, doesn't mean you're not holding them accountable that you have high standards. Our standards, I think, doesn't mean you're not holding them accountable that you have high standards. Our standards, I think, are as high as anywhere in the country for our players. But I think you have to get there in whatever way is authentic to you. It doesn't mean that guys who scream and yell and, and do it through that means are not, you know, not good coaches. There are plenty of great coaches who have shown that that's effective as well. But I do think the biggest key is, are you being, you know, true to who you are as a person? And, are, and, I, and for me, I have two boys. I know you have kids as well. Am I coaching these kids as I would want my children coach if they were coached by somebody else? Well, and it speaks also to the challenge coaches. I think sometimes, especially this is a really important message for young coaches, is that sometimes they buy into there's a certain way you're supposed to act as a coach because of the way media portrays it or because the way that they've been coached. And especially young coaches, as you said, be true to yourself. But I don't think acting like a lunatic is true to anyone's self. I think sometimes it just is is kind of, I mean, your record speaks for itself and the demeanor and the, the behavior that you demonstrate you know, is again, it's just another example of doing things, in my opinion, true to yourself, but in a way that is, look, if someone maybe watched your practice sometime like I did, they'd be, oh, this guy isn't very intense. He's not really Mm -hmm. into this. Right. It's it's not that at all. It was 100% focused on, as you said, joy, but also communication, teaching. It was a great classroom. 
it would have been a great classroom anywhere in the world. And I appreciate uh, that. I really do. And I try to, you know, that's what we want. We want to make it to where we're teaching. And again, if you, and I think you would agree with this, one of the big things to me with having a team that's successful and home ball, road ball, whatever, but when you're playing is to have a team that's steady, right? And you're not riding an emotional roller coaster and you have composure and poise. And if as a coach, you're not demonstrating that, then how, and if, as a coach, you're not demonstrating that, then how can you expect your team to embody that? It's, it's, you know, it's, so, I mean, it's truth. I mean, and that's a valuable thing. To win. No, you can't. And it doesn't mean that you never lose your cool. Like I said, yeah. I'm not saying that we I never get upset. I do. But at the end of the day, I want our guys, you know, to play with poise, to play possession by possession. So, you know, in a game for me or in practice to get overly emotional or to, again, I want there to be an environment that I think, is constructive in our coaching that I feel better when we're trying to be positive and help these guys grow and that they know, Hey, your growth and development is our number one priority. And we're going to try to teach you everything we know. We're going to hold you accountable to a high standard. We're not going to demean you in the process of doing it. I don't think, again, those things have to be separate. Like you can coach people and coach them hard without screaming and yelling at them. Coach again, great, great stuff. Coach, can you talk yelling at them? Coach, again, great, great stuff. Coach, can you talk a little bit about defensive warm up? I had a chance to watch that, and I know it's a concept that's a part of your philosophy, and it aligns very much with my philosophy of the game's approach and getting right to the context of the game and removing a lot of fluff from your practice. And can you talk about the defensive warm up? Because I understand that you do that on a daily basis. Dave Smart is one of the best coaches in the world, and now you can learn from him with never-before-available access. In clinic are available at davesmartbasketball.com. What makes these all-access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force We Can defensive system is world-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase Ald. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. Yeah, no, we, we do. And in the beginning of the season, when you were here, you know, what we'll do in the summer is take, you know, the teams in our league and maybe some of our early season opponents and we'll do a full, you know, offensive breakdown, everything that they run. And then what we'll do, and I believe this is we'll come out and most every day we start with a small talk and teach segment. And that'll be, you know, if it's early in the year, it'll be a discussion of things maybe that we're not doing as well as we need to ball screen coverages with just some demonstrations. I do think you have their attention most at the very beginning and because it's a warm-up segment we haven't done anything yet guys are pretty locked in and it's a great time to introduce new things so maybe it's introducing a play maybe it's talking about areas we can improve early in the season and then we get right into as you mentioned if, if it's now like at this part of the season it'll be a great time to introduce new things so maybe it's introducing a play maybe it's talking about areas we can improve early in the season and then we get right into as you mentioned if, if it's now like at this part of the season it'll be where it's specific to game plan of who we're playing next. And here's how we're doing X, Y, and Z. But to get to the defensive warm-up piece, you know, early in the year, what we'll do is I'll choreograph or script some different actions that I think that, that we need to guard, and we'll spend about 10 minutes. The scout team will. It'll be some coaches and maybe some of the uh, walk-ons or whatever that'll come out with, as five. And we'll go through, and it's not anything that anybody runs, but it's a variety of actions that we need to know that we need to guard and that we're going to be seeing moving forward. And we talk about at that point in defensive warmup, we're going half speed, but be perfect 
in your positioning and be perfect in your talk. Come off a horns ball screen. Well, how are we guarding that? Maybe it's a four that's a shooter, so we would show, or a four that's a non, we're in drop. You know, he, he pops and they'll throw it and chase to an action. We may ice something, dribble handoffs, work on X outs. We're working on all kinds of defensive principles and habits that we need to take forward with us moving into the season. And that's really a lot of our preseason stuff is understanding and working on that. And we'll take about a 10 minute block every day at the beginning of practice, particularly into October, November, and work on developing those habits as it gets to the point we are now where you're playing games, then we'll take the opponent's top three or four actions. Here's their three or four main sets they run. And we're going to guard those at half speed. Again, perfect positioning, perfect talk, understanding what we're trying to take away. But I do think before you get into dynamic warm-up, before you get into going up and down and moving, I think it's a great thing before you get into dynamic warm-up, before you get into going up and down and moving, I think it's a great time to work on developing those habits and guys understanding what you're doing defensively, what these situations are. You can explain it. There's not a lot of running around. Everybody's on one end and the scout team guys, the coaches, et cetera, know what they're doing. So they're running through it. Now we're just learning how to guard different actions. And for me, again, it's mental effort over physical. Right. Coaches can talk about a lot of things and I just think there's so much more value to doing that as a component, because again, you're still doing it within the context of the game. Like it's not on air, it's right. offense versus defense. It's not live because it's part of your warm up phase or your talk and teach phase. But your mm-hmm. players are getting the context of what you're going to work on, whether it's that day or whether you have to prepare for scout or whatever. So I think it's right. a really good concept. I think it's just a part. And also, the other part, coach, I wanted to highlight is that this that might exist within a practice so that your players focus on learning. Right. And I think you build blocks. So like if it's in season right now and it's a scout level thing, usually the first day we prepare for an opponent, let's say we're preparing to play Windsor, you know, we'll come out and talk and teach for five minutes, go over, you know, how we're guarding this, how we're guarding that. We'll spend a 10 minute block on defensive warm up, and I'll have your four main things that you guys run that we think we need to take away. And then we'll do that in defensive warm up. We'll get loose and get to it. And then we'll come back. And we'll guard, we say, okay, we're guarding Windsor half court to the action. So you'll come out and we'll, and the scout team's now done it in defensive warm up. Now they'll run however many plays they can get to in 10 minutes. We're guarding it. We're telling them how we want to guard it. And if you, if the scout at that point can score out of the action, then you score. If they can, it's dead on the action. And we'll come back a little later in practice and maybe stuff we want to run into guarding Windsor in transition. You guys are on the baseline, have a ball, and now we're guarding. So you're allocating, kind of building up. By the time they get to the transition, you know, they know Windsor stuff pretty good. The scout team does. You know, they've run it for 20 minutes. And so then we'll get into transition. And we, it's kind of a build up and everything we do. I, I think you and I have talked about it. I really believe in trying to, to multitask, but I also believe in trying to simulate and do as much from a games approach as you do. And I think that's a big thing for me. Is trying to be efficient with it, be respectful of our players' time, but also make sure we're getting in and getting reps that it makes sense to simulate what you're going to see and have to do to be successful in the next game. What a great segue because multitask and cross-teaching is, again, I think something that speaks to your expertise as a coach. And can you talk about that? Because I think that's so important because, again, I think we're getting into a dangerous domain sometimes when especially you look at certain, you go, okay, well, this person is a defensive coordinator, this person is an offensive coordinator. And again, I'm not against that or naming right. that, but reality is you're a basketball coach mm-hmm. and your ability to cross teach and multitask within drills is a defining point of expertise, I believe, for any coach, but especially a basketball coach. Yeah. I mean, the game is, it, it, I've never understood that. I mean, I think basketball is the one sport where it's tied together, right? I mean, like good offense usually begets good defense, right? And good defense begets good offense. Like if you're taking the ball to net every time because you can't guard anybody, it's hard to run great offense because you're never getting anything in transition. And if you're turning the ball over and the other team's playing two on one or one on none and dunking it, or you're taking bad shots, you have no floor balance, hard to be a good defensive team. And so basketball is the one sport that is truly tied together where everything is, you know, so that makes no sense 
in my opinion, to specialize in one college situation. I'm not like that here, but, you know, maybe it's a head coach and one assistant, you know, and, and, and if you're only coaching one aspect, you know, how are you doing that? But I do think it's important. We talk about trying to be respectful of guys' time, try to be efficient with our practice time. And so how many things can we bring into a drill to work on? Instead of saying, uh, I'll give an example, I guess. So we do a drill where we'll say, okay, we're playing five on five in the half defense. You know, we're playing white is on offense, blue is on defense, and, and blue is at half speed on the initial possession. Five on five. We're running our stuff. I want to see execution. And we're not, there's no score on this first, on this first half course. So I work on half execution with white. As soon as white runs their offense, they run the play correctly. They score, you know, we'll leave the white big man down under the rim and blue will come at white five on four. Now we are live. We've worked on half court execution live. We've worked on half court execution five on five. Now here comes blue transitioning at white five on four and blue is now working on advantage offense. White's working on disadvantage defense and we're guarding and we play and they can play to the score or rebound, obviously because the white big man is down on the opposite end. It stresses the blue team to make sure make miss. Obviously you can't do it if it's a turnover that they get back and get the basket covered and set our transition. So the third possession would be, no matter what happens, white bringing it back at blue, finishing down there five on five, working on our flow offense at that point. And so there's an example of you could certainly do, you know, free throw transition. And we don't we do that occasionally and, you know, and spend 10 minutes working on, you know, transition D at a disadvantage and advantage offense. But what if you transition D at a disadvantage and advantage offense? But what if you can bring in, you know, offensive execution, disadvantage defense, your flow offense, right? And you can combine all those things into one drill and you take a 10 minute block and you hit on four things instead of one or two. And that's always what we're looking to do is look at ways to what we call multitask, but bring as many different facets of a real game into a drill. And that allows us hopefully to shorten practices so we're not going you know, two and a half hours, three hours, we do believe in trying to get it and condense it in, but also get to all the things that you need to do. Because obviously, you know, good teams are about building habits, you got to build those habits. But what's the most efficient way to do that? And if you can get drills where you can touch on a lot of different areas, then that I think that helps you to be more successful as a coach. And And it helps the guys in terms of we're not doing I used to do it where that same work would take me, you know, 30, 40 minutes because we're running half court offense and we're doing do too as a coach. And that's, well, how do you develop your ability to coach? How do you develop your ability to watch or to watch video? And the easy answer is everyone says, well, to watch off the ball. And mm-hmm. my also answer is to coach both sides of the ball or to watch video and watch both sides of the ball. Because too right. often, again, when coaches watch video, I don't think they improve their ability to watch video because they're only watching the offense. Whereas That's a great point. when you're cross teaching or you're multitasking within drills, I mean, you're really developing your ability to see both and see why something worked or why something didn't work from both perspectives. And yeah, uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a unique ability to see all 10, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah. something that every coach is different. It's an area that I'm, I'm still really working on getting better at. I have one of my assistants, you know, he sees all 10 all the time. Some guys, you know, but I do agree with you when you're just fixating on one thing, I do think that, you know, it takes away. And so every drill that you can do that you're blending, it makes you more efficient. And that was even a, you know, I guess like consequent, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's something that every coach is different. It's an area that I'm, I'm still really working on getting better at. I have one of my assistants, you know, he sees all 10 all the time. Some guys, you know, but I do agree with you when you're just fixating on one thing, I do think that, you know, it takes away. And so every drill that you can do that you're blending, it makes you more efficient. And that was even a, you know, I guess like, consequence or a benefit I didn't even think of is that certainly your ability to see all 10 improves. And that's, that goes back to trying to do it live. And then, and then certainly, you know, in games, and then when you're watching video agreed, you know, if you can, if you can really sit down and, and film every practice, go back and watch it and see the things you miss. Cause even live, you're not going to get everything that you will film is always a better indicator than what you see live, but your ability to see as much as you can live helps you because become a better coach because that indicates adjustments. You know, if something's not working and you don't know why it's not working or if something's effective against you, 
and you don't know what's what they're doing because you're not you're not able to see it. But your practice is like a game, so you become better in practice at identifying things you would do in a game. And it all makes too much sense to me, but I understand that somewhat it's still surprisingly non-traditional in a lot of it's ways. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's strange crazy. that it would be, but no, I do think that I think it's a that's the best path to becoming a better coach, which is what we're all, you know, striving to do. No matter where you are, I, all of us are, are trying to get better and improve, and, and that's one of the areas that I think is a huge area of growth that's undervalued or overlooked by a lot of coaches is is your ability to see as many of the ten and what's going on inside of that as possible. There's a lot of things I want to get to, and let's go. You attended Celtics training camp. And Mm -hmm. can you talk about some of the takeaways? Because I I know it had a big influence on some of the things that you guys do. And, you know, and and when we talk about learning from so many people and you're a lifelong learner, there's no question about that. But let's start with the Celtics training camp. Can you give us a few takeaways? Yeah, well, the first was how... Let's start with the Celtics training camp. Can you give us a few takeaways? Yeah, well, the first was how inadequate I was as a coach. That was... (laughs) That was the first thing I walked out of there and he's like, God, I'm completely incompetent. You, you look at, at how great Brad is and his staff is and the level that they teach at. And it was, uh, I was fortunate. I was able to go to, to training camp, you know, two full training camps with them and then one with the jazz. And you just walk out and the level of teaching, how in depth they are, how intelligent the players are, you know, you would just be amazed. And I've really been to, so Boston, Mike Budenholzer in Atlanta and then, and then Quinn Snyder in Utah. That's three of the best coaches in the world. And they're different in their approaches, but you, you just walk out amazed at the, at the level of teaching, how thorough they are, how concise the drills are. And probably as big a takeaway was how intelligent the players were. I mean, guys are running, you know, uh, first day of uh, Celtics training camp. They probably, have, they probably have eight or nine things in that they could run that day. And it's the first day. That's amazing. In that situation. And that's day one. And then it builds from there. But in terms of, for me, the first time I went to Celtics camp, I thought it was philosophically a really kind of a epiphany for me in terms of how we play offensively. I think I was much more predictable, stationary. We're going to play, you know, this way. And, and we ran things and everything was, was pretty straightforward. It's very structured and not a lot of freedom. And when I watched them play and the, and the way they played in transition and, and the quick hitters and that you could on a made basket still play fast, get to some stuff. And then the emphasis on flow and whatever flow means to you really was really a program changer for us. We had just come off a season where we were, you know, 30 and three. And I remember coming back from Boston and it was in September, end of September. So I already had out <laughs> because I thought this is a, a much better way to do it offensively and we were a good offensive team we were averaging you know high 70s low 80s but you know since that trip we've been in the 90s each and every year and and haven't lost the efficiency right I mean that's been the biggest key is we're not just playing fast playing crazy you know we've shot I think and this year again with the younger team we're not quite as good but we've been you know we led the nation last year I think we shot 54 percent from the field and, and doing it in a way that's efficient but it was really eye-opening for me in terms of being able to play fast and giving guys freedom within structure. I was giving them a lot of structure, but no freedom. I wasn't giving them concepts. And you understand now how important that is to give guys some concepts. It can't be just completely on their own terms, but can you get guys to read, react, play within structure and concepts, give them freedom to kind of soar with their strengths? Yeah, no, it was a great takeaway. And I remember having the conversation for you. And we haven't had a chance to talk much about the Jack, much about the Jazz training camp. But were there any really significant takeaways from that? I mean, obviously, it was a tremendous experience, but anything that you directly applied? Yeah, I mean, I think the way they run in transition, the emphasis on transition on misses, some of their, I think, defensive concepts are, are really unique. The way, you know, they, and I think, you know, Quinn did a clinic, I might not give anything away that he hasn't said, but you know, the way they talk about channel and that that's their ice ball screen coverage. And they have various channels depending on, you know, the big in. So channel two is deeper coverage, you know, so like a Rudy Gobert and a more athletic guys in channel three. So he's up closer, almost like a, like a level, you know, and their ability to process all that. I think he's just a tremendous defensive coach. He does a wonderful job. He's got a, a, a much more of a European flavor. I think uh, working over for uh, Messina, internationally has given him he's the guy that uh, they have a tremendous 
kind of freewheeling, drive and kick. And their emphasis, I guess the seat, the stuff in transition was great for us. And then their emphasis in the half court on what, what they call, you know, the blender and getting that initial drive and getting your shoulders by and touching paint and collapsing the defense and then playing behind that. And just, you know, I love the term, you know, blender, uh, we would call it, you know, get the cycle started, but the blender is a way better, you talk about language, way better way to say it and love the emphasis on, Hey, you know, get your shoulders by touch paint and then, you know, make the right bat. You know, they talk all the time about rim decisions and what are your rim decisions and you're driving it. And if you draw help, obviously, kick it. He's very simple. I mean, you know, if you're open, shoot it. If you're playing off a closeout, drive it. If you drive it and there's no help, finish it. If you drive it and you draw help, kick it and make the right basketball play. And just love this simplicity. And but talking about three guys that are just, you know, at the very top end. But that was the biggest takeaway uh, walking out of each training camp was, again, my inadequacy as a coach, inadequacy as a coach and how much better ways to do things. And, and that it's, it's a constant evolution. So you're always trying to learn and grow and It was great for me from an experience standpoint. It's made me a lot better coach. Uh, Each of those opportunities, and you're just grateful that they're kind enough to give you those opportunities. So many good takeaways. And I just want to remind people that you won 83% of your game. So I don't think you need to be humbled too much by that. But again, it speaks to your learning attitude and your mindset in terms of all the things that you've done. And, And it really struck me after you talked about your Boston training camp thing that it's not like you weren't incredibly successful when you decided to make some changes to give your players more freedom as well. What you were doing was working, but it right. just, you know, the light came on for you to say, hey, listen, this just seems like a better thing for my players and coming back to that core value of enjoyment. I'm sure that's added to it in terms of that for your players too. Yeah, no, no question. I think you're always looking at, you know, the game is ever evolving, right? I mean, it's not even, like, you know, we don't do really almost any of the same drills. We don't recruit the same. You know, our recruiting philosophy has changed because the game's changed. So instead of recruiting five positions, you know, we recruit really three. And so the way that the implementation and the take, people really trying to take advantage of the three-point shot has changed. I mean, we were a team that if we ever got to 23 point attempts in a game, I was like, geez, you know, we're just settling way too much. You got to pound it inside. And that was kind of what was, was, you know, the way I was brought up and that was the way the game was played. And we had some really good big guys who were probably intelligent at that time. But there's games this year we've shot, you know, 40 plus threes because that's what the defense has given us. And, you know, so that's the way you play and you play it as best you can inside of, again, we have an analytics guy and we do all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you know, we're hunting great. And if great's a wide open three early in the clock or at some point, great. If, if great is a guy drives and gets a wide open mid, we're OK with that, too. We're not mandating those things, obviously, like most offense offenses you want to live in the you know, free throws, threes and layups, but you know, there's, there's exceptions to everything, but no, I agree. I think it's been a much, a much more fun way to play. It's opened up and allowed our guys a lot more freedom. And I think it's made the player development piece a lot more relevant because now you're taking skills that they're developing and they're able to go out and show those skills as they become better at them. We always talk about in our program, you know, do what you do best, i.e. soar with your strengths, right? What do you do? Well, what do you bring to the table? Let's soar with your strengths. But we also want the guys to get in the gym and get in and player development piece is a huge part of our program. You know, we call them vitamins and then we do them because they're daily. And so we do a, you know, each player has a a coach assigned to them and they do a 20 minute workout each day, you know, that's allowed with said coach. And kind of a funny anecdote to that was this year, we have so many freshmen, we told them we were doing vitamins. And I guess I wasn't anecdote to that was, this year, we have so many freshmen, we told them we were doing vitamins, and I guess I wasn't very thorough in my explanation. And a couple of freshmen showed up in their flip-flops with a glass of water, thought they're actually taking vitamins. <laughs> but they were, that's wow. a true story. But we do that piece, and so, but that they can develop these skills, and they're able to translate them and show them inside of what we're doing. So I think across the board, it's been better. I think, you know, we've had guys go on to be successful at the pro level, and we've had some pro coaches call and talk to us, and, and that are looking at, you know, stuff we're doing, you know, offensively and pick our brains on it. And it's, it's been very cool. And again, a lot of it, I don't take any credit for any, it's really uh, completely stuff we've stolen and, and tried to tweak and make our own. Uh, it's great stuff. And you mentioned analytics. So let's just quickly get into that. Cause you talked about this, that a box score essentially that has no validation for a right. player. 
And right. you talk about some of the things that you've used to validate players, because I think that's a really important part of the analytics that sometimes we we miss. Sometimes we we miss is that you know finding a way for these analytics to work to validate a player are really important. And you mentioned you know some things that you chart like EPAs, but I think Screen Assist was another uh, yeah. some of the things that you do. Yeah, for sure. Screen Assist really came with Emmanuel Terry, who's now uh, in the G League with the Heat. You know, he was a guy that was a a great ball screener. And he would get guys open, whether it was on a ball screen or maybe in our point action, he would come in and, and set a wide pin down and get a set a great screen and guy would come off wide open and make the shot. And that guy gets two points. And, you know, what does Emmanuel Terry get? You know, in the box score, no validation for that. Right. So, you know, screen assists are something we chart and that's a screen that leads, you know, directly to an assist. We try to get in and quantify and measure what we think are winning plays or effort plays that don't get affirmation inside of the box score. And so screen assists are one. We talk about free throw assists. You know, you drive it, you get by the box score. And so screen assists are one. We talk about free throw assists. You know, you drive it, you get by, you force help, you throw it to the big, he goes up to dunk it and they foul him. There's not an assist for that, but there should be. He was a great play. You got us two points, hopefully. You know, hockey assists, what we would call the blender, right? Guy drives it, forces help, skips it opposite. The guy opposite makes the one more for the wide open three. That guy drills it. Again, no measure for that in the box score. But really, the guy in the corner who caught it, you know, he just had to move it one more. He didn't, you know what I mean? And so uh, hockey assists are something that we chart, you know, and then the, and then the general stuff, you know, uh, obviously deflections and, and, and all those things that go into to winning. But you're trying to, as best you can, bring validation and affirmation to acts that you know you know we chart loose balls how many loose balls does a guy get and how many is the average a game and and charges and all those things but you're trying to do those things to again spotlight do those things to again spotlight guys when you come in and talk to your team the next day you know you can talk about hey emmanuel terry you know seven screen assists what an unbelievable night you know did a great job getting guys open where if you don't do those things and they're not rewarded and emphasized, then I don't know if you're going to get them. And those are all things that go into winning, right? I mean, you know, we, we chart shot contests. We'll talk about individual guys' shot contest percentage because that's an effort thing, you know, shrinking in a gap and getting out and flying out and making a great contest. So all those things are charted as individually, and then we share them with the team, you know, the day after the game so guys understand the importance and value because those are things that directly translate to playing good basketball and winning games. Yeah, no, validating players is so important. Noticing their progress, noticing their success. And it's good stuff to get people thinking more about kind of the things that we do to validate them. And the other concept was clean stops concept, which I thought was really losing team, gets a wide open layup and misses it. That, right. that we didn't truly stop them. They just missed. And right. How do you do that within what you do? Is that through video analysis or do you chart that live in the game practice? Or is that just something that you uh, emphasize within your players? We chart that in practice. We chart that in games. You know, the, the things that we're, we're charting, I think there's always a quantitative piece, right? The, the raw numbers. And then there's a qualitative piece, which is would be the eye test. And, you know, you're looking at the quality of defensive possessions. So you can look at a possession – and from a quantitative standpoint, like you said, guy drives in, he's got a wide open layup, he misses it. Next possession down, same guy takes a highly contested three over defense and drills it. You know, now from a quantitative standpoint, first possession was outstanding, second possession was terrible. From a qualitative standpoint, you know, terrible. From a qualitative standpoint, you know, it's the complete opposite. And it's getting guys to understand the qualitative piece and that, you know, there's certainly a combination. And we do, like I said, we do give guys numbers. We do track at halftime. They'll get, you know, a variety of analytic numbers, you know, and points, you know, points per possession for both teams is at the top end. Because uh, we don't spend a whole lot of time, you know, worried about, in a sense, like, okay, if you're holding people to field goal percentage defense, 35%, but you're giving up 40 free throws, it's not good defense. And Absolutely. so we're trying to, again, but maybe, you know, you're playing a team and, and, and this is ironic, you know, it happened to us in a game the other day, you know, first half, you know, we held the opponent to 27% and thought we did a great job of contesting shots. Our shot contest percentage was at a really high level 
In the second half, the same team shot 68%, but our shot contest percentage was a shade below that, but not significant. You have to just tip your cap some and say, hey, these guys, it wasn't a, a complete break. There's been games, though, where we've given up 38% for the game, and I felt like we've defended terrible. So we talk all the time about you know clean stops and it being a qualitative thing, and the whole goal defensively, however you want to boil it down, is you want the opponent every possession to take a highly contested shot. And whether that's, you know, I don't think there's a lot of secrets defensively. You know, you got to be great in transition defense to do that. You've got to be terrific at protecting the paint, keeping the ball out of the paint, whether that's on the ball, off the ball, shrinking, all those things. And then you got to be great at closing possessions and finishing possessions with rebounds. And so understanding that and, and understanding the difference between stops and clean stops and quantitative and qualitative are things that we do talk about, you know, with our guys. And in practice, how we do it is, you know, we don't credit a stop that was we get a high contest and a great contest and a guy drills one. Then, you know, we also in those defensive drills, we don't, get, you know, penalize the guys either. We give them, you know, a, a positive to stop. Well, in this era of just deferring to analytics, it, again, it, it shows why, coaching is still important because <laughs> to define what actually worked is so important, so much more important to a certain extent too, than the result and saying like, we can right. really good defense and get scored on and then right. play bad defense and not get scored on. And you know, those factors play into it. So I think it's such an important thing to highlight for coaches. Well, over time, you know, I mean, you have to believe that if, if you're coming down and, and you're generating wide open shots, and you're coming down on the other end, you're going down and you're really stingy defensively and you're making everything difficult and the opponent's taking contested shots that over time, over a 40 minute window, you know, you're going to be successful. And that's what it's really getting guys on time over a 40 minute window, you know, you're going to be successful. And that's what it's really getting guys to understand is not just be happy that the, uh, there's a difference between somebody missing shots and you making them miss shots. We always talk about the cumulative effect and we've seen it on both ends, you know, and I'm sure you have too, where, you know, you're playing a team that's terrific defensively and you're not getting any open looks. And all of a sudden you do get an open look and you're so excited you rush it and you miss it because you hadn't had an open look in forever. And that's the cumulative effect. If you're able to really be, be tight and guard and then even when opponent, you do have an occasional breakdown, the opponent's much less likely to make it because they're so you know excited to be open and they rush it and, and all of a sudden they're off and and uh, it doesn't allow them to kind of get that level of comfort that you do when you're just generating open look after open look after open look. Yeah, again, so many amazing things that, that you've highlighted and I think really practical things for coaches and and whether it's the phrasing and the terminology or some of these in time to be able to spend some time with us. And I know uh, at some point we'll circle back and do some more stuff together. And uh, I wish you the best of the luck as you uh, continue on at Lincoln Memorial. Well, Chris, I appreciate it and, and wanted to thank you. I mean, what, what you do for coaches, obviously you're an unbelievable coach in your own right, playing against your team and, and the job you do. And it's just remarkable individually. I know how hard that is because, you know, we all try and some of us, you know, it's just it's just coaching itself is ridiculous. And then for you to really be so invested in the game and other coaches and do what you do is just remarkable. Your ability to share the game, grow the game, to help coaches improve. And I know I've benefited myself tremendously from you your intelligence, your insight into the game has, has really changed and, and helped me grow in my thinking. And so I'm very appreciative to you and all you do for not only myself, but coaches all over the world that, that tune in and listen to you. Well, it's been a blessing for me. And, and as, as, as coaches can see, I have, I've been able to connect with people like you. Well, it's been a blessing for me. And, and as, as, as coaches can see, I have, I've been able to connect with people like you. So this is all worth it. So <laughs> coach, it's awesome. Thank you so much. A quick interruption to this week's episode to let you know what you're missing if you are not currently a member of BasketballImmersion.com. Basketball Immersion is one-stop shopping for video learning to stimulate your basketball coaching using evidence-based practices. Watch hundreds of videos covering BDT shooting, zero-second skill training, how we teach using small-sided games and a games approach to coaching, as well as team concepts and systems like trail trap, flow offense, two-sided fast break, and much, much more. NCAA 
NBA, pro, high school, and youth coaches are amongst the thousands of coaches who are a part of our